Hi, I'm Rod Taylor, and I'm watching something from a long time ago. It's a wonderful show that I did. It was called And When the Sky Was Open. I probably even look young and beautiful. <laughs> Right now you're in a kind of a limbo. You're neither here nor there. Where are we? Between light and shadow. Greetings and salutations, moon boys and astro girls. If this is your first time here, welcome. On Between Light and Shadow, we look beneath the slick black and white veneer of two classic episodes of The Twilight Zone, but not just any two classic episodes. We select two similar episodes, episodes that share, oh, perhaps a common theme or a common story concept or a common actor. And after we've burrowed into them like eager scabies and analyzed them front to back, we line them up like beauty pageant finalists and declare one to be superior. Now that we simultaneously repulsed and offended you, let's begin. Oh, wait, we're actually going to deviate from our usual formula since we're only covering one episode this week. But it's a pretty great one. At least, I think it is. Now, last week, I made the following observation. So I guess I gravitate a bit toward the episodes that spark that inner dialogue. Who am I? Who are any of us? How do I fit into the universe? And what happens if I don't fit into it? If I die or just disappear altogether, would the world be any different at all? The episode we're looking at this week plums that particular existential cave deeply and with great gusto. The teleplay was written by Ron Serling, but the idea didn't originate with him. It's based on Disappearing Act, a short story by Richard Matheson, which was first published in the March 1953 issue of the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. And as we'll see, it's barely an adaptation. Only the core concept carries over from page to screen. Everything else is completely different, including the title. Now, since the short story came first, we'll start there. And ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present a dramatic reading of Matheson's short story by none other than Tom Elliott from the excellent Twilight Zone podcast. Take it away, Tom. <laughs> Disappearing Act by Richard Matheson Saturday morning, early I shouldn't be writing this What if Mary found it? Then what? The end, that's what Five years out of the window But I have to put it down I've been writing too long There's no peace unless I put things on paper I have to get them out and simplify my mind but it's so hard to make things simple, and so easy to make them complicated. Thinking back through the months, where did it start? An argument, of course, there must have been a thousand of them since we married, and always the same one. That's the horror. Money. It's not a question of confidence in your writing, Mary will say. It's a question of bills, and are we or aren't we going to pay them? Bills for what, I'll say. For necessities? No, for things we don't even need. Don't need? And off we go. God, how impossible life is without money. Nothing can overcome it. It's everything when it's anything. How can I write in peace with endless worries of money, money, money? The television set, the refrigerator, the washer, none of them paid for yet and the bed she wants. But despite all, I, 
I with wide-eyed idiocy keep making it even worse. Why did I have to storm out of the argument that first time? We'd argued, sure, but we'd argued before. Vanity, that's all. After seven years, seven of writing, I've made only $316 from it. And I'm still working nights at the lousy part-time job typing. And Mary has to keep working at the same place with me. Lord knows she has a perfect right to doubt. A perfect right to keep insisting I take that full-time job Jim keeps offering me on his magazine. All up to me. An admission of lack. A right move and everything would be solved. No more night work. Mary could stay home the way she wants to. The way she should. The right move. That's all. So I've been making the wrong one. God, it makes me sick. Me going out with Mike, both of us glassy-eyed imbeciles, meeting Jean and Sally, for months now pushing aside the obvious knowledge that we were being fools, losing ourselves in a new experience, playing the ass to perfection, and last night both of us, married men, going with them to their club apartment, and... Can't I say it? Am I too afraid? Too weak? Fool. Adulterer. How can things get so mixed up? I love Mary very much, and yet even loving her, I did this thing. And to make it all even more complicated, I enjoyed it. Jean is sweet and understanding, passionate, a sort of symbol of lost things. It was wonderful. I can't say it wasn't. But how can wrong be wonderful? How can cruelty be exhilarating? It's all perverse. It's jumbled and confused and enraging. Saturday afternoon. She's forgiven me, thank God. I'll never see Jean again. Everything will be all right. This morning I went and sat on the bed and Mary woke up. She stared up at me, then looked at the clock. She'd been crying. Where have you been? She asked in that thin little girl voice she gets when she's scared. With Mike, I told her. We drank and talked all night. She stared a second more. Then she took my hand slowly and pressed it against her cheek. I'm sorry, she said, and tears came to her eyes. I had to put my head next to hers so she wouldn't see my face. Oh, Mary, I said. I'm sorry too. I'll never tell her. She meant too much to me. I can't lose her. Saturday night. We went down to Mandel's Furniture Mart this afternoon and got a new bed. We can't afford it, honey, Mary said. Never mind, I said. You know how lumpy the old one is. I want my baby to sleep in style. She kissed my cheek happily. She bounced on the bed like an excited kid. Oh, feel how soft, she said. Everything is all right. Everything except a new batch of bills in today's mail. Everything except for my latest story, which won't get started. Everything except for my novel, which has bounced five times. Benley House has to take it. They've held it long enough. I'm counting on it. Things are coming to a head with my writing. With everything. More and more I get the feeling that I'm a wound-up spring. Well, Mary's all right. Sunday night. More trouble. Another argument. I don't even know what it was about. She's sulking. I'm burning. I can't write when I'm upset. She knows that. I feel like calling Jean. At least she was interested in my writing. I feel like saying the hell with everything. Getting drunk, jumping off a bridge. Something. No wonder babies are happy. Life is simple for them. Some hunger, some cold, a little fear of darkness, that's all. Why bother growing up? Life gets too complicated. Mary just called me for supper. I don't feel like eating. I don't even feel like staying in the house. Maybe I'll call up Jean later, just to say hello. Monday morning. Damn, damn, damn. Not only to hold the book over for three months, that's not bad enough, oh no. 
they had to spill coffee all over the manuscript and send me a printed rejection slip to boot? I could kill them. I wonder if they think they know what they're doing. Mary saw the slip. Well, what now? She said disgustedly. Now, I said. I tried not to explode. Still think you can write? She asked. I exploded. Oh, they're the last judge and jury, aren't they? I raged. They're the final word on my writing, aren't they? You've been writing for seven years, she said. Nothing's happened. And I'll write seven more, I said. A hundred, a thousand. You won't take that job on Jim's magazine? No, I will not. You said you would if the book failed. I have a job, I said. And you have a job, and that's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to stay. It's not the way I'm going to stay, she snapped. She may leave me, who cares? I'm sick of it all anyway. Bills, bills, writing, writing, failures, failures, failures. And little old life dribbling on, building up its beautiful brain-busting complexities, like an idiot with blocks. You, who run the world, who spin the universe. If there's anybody listening to me, make the world simpler. I don't believe in anything, but I'd give anything. If only. Oh, what's the use? I don't care anymore. I'm calling Jean tonight. Monday afternoon. I just went down to call up Jean about Saturday night. Mary is going to her sister's house that night. She hasn't mentioned me going with her, so I'm certainly not going to mention it. I called Jean last night, but the switchboard operator at the club Stanley said she was out. I figured I'd be able to reach her today at her office. So I went to the corner candy store to look up the number. I probably should have memorised it by now. I've called her enough. But somehow, I never bothered. What the hell? There are always telephone books. She works for a magazine called Design Handbook or Designer's Handbook or something like that. Odd, I, I can't remember that either. Guess I never gave it much thought. I do remember where the office is, though. I called for her there a few months ago and took her to lunch. I think I told Mary I was going to the library that day. Now, as I recall, the telephone number of Jean's office was in the upper right-hand corner of the right page in the directory. I've looked it up dozens of times, and that's where it always was. Today it wasn't. I found the word design and different business names starting with that word. But they were in the lower left-hand corner of the left page, just the opposite. And I couldn't seem to find any name that clicked. Usually, as soon as I see the name of the magazine, I think, there it is. Then I look up the number. Today it wasn't like that. I looked and looked, and thumbed around, but I couldn't find anything like Design Handbook. Finally, I settled for the number of Design Magazine, but I had the feeling it wasn't the one I was searching for. I'll have to finish this later. Mary just called me for lunch, dinner, what have you. The big meal of the day, anyway, since we both work at night. Later. It was a good meal. Mary can certainly cook. If only there weren't those arguments. I wonder if Jean can cook. At any rate, the meal steadied me a little. I needed it. I was a little nervous about that telephone call. I dialed the number. A woman answered. Design magazine, she said. I'd like to talk to Miss Lane, I told her. Who? Miss Lane. One moment, she said, and I knew it was the wrong number. Every other time I'd called the woman who answered had said, All right, immediately, and connected me with Jean. What was that name again? She asked. Miss Lane, if you don't know her, I must have the wrong number. You might mean Mr. Payne. No, no, before... The secretary who answered always knew right away who I wanted. I have the wrong number, excuse me. I hung up. I was pretty irritated. I've looked that number up so many times, it isn't funny. Now I can't find it. Of course, I didn't let that get to me at first. I thought maybe the phone book in the candy store was an old one. 
so I went down the street to the drugstore. It had the same book. Well, I'll just have to call her from work tonight, but I wanted to get her this afternoon, so I'd be sure she'd save Saturday night for me. I just thought of something. That secretary. Her voice. It was the same one who used to answer. For design handbook. But... Oh, I'm dreaming. Monday night. I called the club while Mary was out of the office getting us some coffee. I told the switchboard operator the same way I've told her dozens of times. I'd like to speak to Miss Lane, please. Yes, sir, one moment, she said. Then there was silence. A long time. I got impatient. Then the phone clicked again. What was that name? The operator asked. Miss Lane, Miss Lane, I said. I've called her any number of times. I'll look at the list again, she said. I waited some more. Then I heard her voice again. I'm sorry, nobody by that name is listed here. But I've called her any number of times there. Are you sure you have the right number? Yes, yes, I'm sure. This is the Club Stanley, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, that's where I'm calling. I don't know what to say, she said. All I can tell you is I'm certain there isn't anyone by that name living here. But I just called last night. You said she wasn't in. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Are you sure? Absolutely sure? Well, if you want, I'll look at the list again, but nobody by that name is on it. I'm positive. And no one by that name moved out within the last few days? We haven't had a vacancy for a year. Rooms are hard to get in New York, you know. I know, I said, and hung up. I went back to my desk. Mary was back from the drugstore. She told me my coffee was getting cold. I said I was calling Jim in regard to that job. That was an ill-chosen lie. Now she'll start in on that again. I drank my coffee and typed a while, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was trying hard to settle my mind. She has to be somewhere, I thought. I know I didn't dream all those moments together. I know I didn't imagine all the trouble I had, keeping it a secret from Mary. And I know that Mike and Sally didn't. Sally. Sally lived at the Club Stanley too. I told Mary I had a headache and was going out for an aspirin. She said there must be some in the men's room. I told her they were a kind I didn't like. I get involved in the flimsiest lies. I half ran to the nearby drugstore. Naturally, I didn't want to use the phone at work again. The same operator answered my ring. Is Miss Sally Norton there? I asked. One moment, please, she said, and I felt a sinking sensation in my stomach. She always knew the regular members right away, and Sally and Jean had been living there for at least two years. I'm sorry, she said. No one by that name is listed here. I groaned. Oh my God. Is something wrong? She asked. No, Jean Lane and Sally Norton live there. Are you the same party who called a little while ago? Yes. Now look, if this is a joke... A joke? Last night I called you, and you told me Miss Lane was out, and would I like to leave a message? I said no. Then I call tonight, and you tell me there's nobody there by that name. I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. I was on the board last night, but I don't recall what you say. If you like, I'll connect you with the house manager. No, never mind, I said, and hung up. Then I dialed Mike's number, but he wasn't home. His wife Gladys answered, told me Mike had gone bowling. I was a little nervous or I wouldn't have slipped up. With the boys, I asked. She sounded kind of slighted. Well, I hope so, she said. I'm getting scared. Tuesday night. I called Mike again tonight. I asked him about Sally. Who? Sally. Sally who? He asked. You know damn well, Sally who, you hypocrite. What is this, a gag? He asked. Maybe it is, I said. How about cutting it out? Let's start over, he said. Who the hell is Sally? You don't know Sally Norton? No. Who is she? You never went on a date with her and Jean Lane and me? Jean Lane? What are you talking about? 
You don't know Jean Lane either? No, I don't, and this is getting very unfunny. I don't know what you're trying to pull, but cut it out. As two married men, we... Listen, I almost shouted into the phone. Where were you three weeks ago, a Saturday night? He was silent a moment. Wasn't that the night you and I batched while Mary and Glad went to see the fashion show at... Batched? There was no one with us? Who? No girls, Sally, Jean. Oh, here we go again, he groaned. Look, pal, what's eating you? Anything I can do? I slumped against the wall of the telephone booth. No, I said weakly. No. Are you sure you're all right? You sound upset as hell. I hung up. I am upset. I have a feeling as though I was starving and there wasn't a scrap of food in the whole world to feed me. What's wrong? Wednesday afternoon. There was only one way to find out if Sally and Jean had really disappeared. I had met Jean through a friend I knew at college. Her home is in Chicago and so is my friend Dave's. He was the one who gave me her New York address, the Club Stanley. Naturally, I didn't tell Dave I was married. So I'd looked up Jean and went out with her, and Mike went out with her friend Sally. That's the way it was. I know it happened. So today I wrote a letter to Dave. I told him what had happened. I begged him to check up at her home and write quickly and tell me was it a joke or some amazing set of coincidences. Then I got out my address book. Dave's name is gone from the book. Am I really going crazy? I know perfectly well that the address was in there. I can remember the night years ago when I carefully wrote it down because I didn't want to lose contact with him after he graduated from college. I can even remember the ink blot I made when I wrote it because my pen leaked. The page is blank. I remember his name, how he looked, how he talked, the things we did, the classes we took together. I even had a letter of his he sent me one Easter vacation while I was at school. I remember Mike was over at my room. Since we lived in New York, there wasn't time to get home because the vacation was only for a few days. But Dave had gone home to Chicago, and from there sent us a very funny letter, special delivery. I remember how he sealed it with wax and stamped it with his ring for a gag. The letter's gone from the drawer where I always kept it, and I had three pictures of Dave taken on graduation day. Two of them I kept in my picture album. They're still there, but he's not on them. They're just pictures of the campus with the buildings in the background. I'm afraid to go on looking. I could write to college or call them and ask if Dave ever went there, but I'm afraid to try. Thursday afternoon. Today I went out to Hempstead to see Jim. I went to his office. He was surprised when I walked in. He wanted to know why I'd travelled so far just to see him. Don't tell me you've decided to take that job offer, he said. I asked him, Jim, did you ever hear me talking about a girl named Jean in New York? Jean? No, I don't think so. Come on, Jim, I did mention her to you. Don't you remember the last time you and I and Mike played poker? I told you about her then. I don't remember, Bob, he said. What about her? I can't find her. And I can't find the girl Mike went out with. And Mike denies that I ever knew either of them. He looked confused, so I told him again. Then he said, What's this? Two old married men gallivanting around with? They were just friends, I cut in. I met them through a fellow I knew at college. Don't get any bright ideas. All right, all right, skip it. Where do I fit in? I can't find them. They're gone. I can't even prove they existed. He shrugged. So what? Then he asked me if Mary knew about it. I brushed that off. Didn't I mention Jean in any of my letters? I asked him. Couldn't say. I never keep letters. I left soon after that. He was getting too curious. I can see it now. He tells his wife. His wife tells Mary. Fireworks. When I rode to work late this afternoon, I had the most awful feeling. 
that I was something temporary. When I sat down, it was like resting on air. I guess I must be cracking, because I bumped into an old man deliberately to find out if he saw me or felt me. He snarled and called me a clumsy idiot. I was grateful for that. Thursday night. Tonight at work I called up Mike again to see if he remembered Dave from college. The phone rang, then it clicked off. The operator cut in and asked, What number are you calling, sir? A chill covered me. I gave her the number. She told me there wasn't any such number. The phone fell out of my hand and clattered on the floor. Mary stood up at her desk and looked over. The operator was saying, Hello? 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 I hurriedly put the phone back in the cradle. What happened? Mary asked when I came back to my desk. I dropped the phone, I said. I sat and worked and shivered with cold. I'm afraid to tell Mary about Mike and his wife, Gladys. I'm afraid she'll say she never heard of them. Friday. Today I checked up on Design Handbook. Information told me there was no such publication listed, but I went over to the city anyway. Mary was angry about me going, but I had to go. I went to the building, I looked at the directory in the lobby, and even though I knew I wouldn't find the magazine listed there, it was still a shock that made me feel sick and hollow. I was dizzy as I rode up the elevator. I felt as if I were drifting away from everything. I got off at the third floor, at the exact spot where I called for Jean that afternoon. There was a textile company there. There never was a magazine here? I asked the receptionist. Not as long as I can remember, she said. Of course, I've only been here three years. I went home. I told Mary I was sick and I didn't want to go to work tonight. She said all right and she wouldn't go either. I went into the bedroom to be alone. I stood in the place where we're going to put the new bed when it's delivered next week. Mary came in. She stood in the doorway restively. Bob, what's the matter? She asked. Don't I have a right to know? Nothing, I told her. Oh, please don't tell me that, she said. I know there is. I started toward her. Then I turned away. I have to write a letter, I said. Who to? That's my business, I said. Then I told her to Jim. She turned away. I wish I could believe you, she said. What does that mean? I asked. She looked at me for a long moment, then turned away again. Give Jim my best, she said, and her voice shook. The way she said it made me shudder. I sat down and wrote the letter to Jim. I decided he might help. Things were too desperate for secrecy. I told him that Mike was gone. I asked him if he remembered Mike. Funny, my hand hardly shook at all. Maybe that's the way it is when you're almost gone. Saturday. Mary had to work on some special typing today. She left early. After I had breakfast, I got the bank book out of the metal box in the bedroom closet. I was going down to the bank to get the money for the bed. At the bank, I filled out the withdrawal slip for $97. Then I waited in line and finally handed the slip and the book to the teller. He opened it and looked up with a frown. Are this supposed to be funny? He asked. What do you mean funny? He pushed the book across to me. Next, he said. I guess I shouted, what's the matter with you? Out of the corner of my eye, I saw one of the men at the front desks jump up and hurry over. A woman behind me said, let me at the window if you please. The man came fussing up. What seems to be the trouble, sir? He asked me. The teller refuses to honor my bank book, I told him. He asked for the book and I handed it to him. He opened it. Then he looked up in surprise. He spoke quietly. This book is blank, he said. I grabbed it and stared at it, my heart pounding. It was completely unused. Oh my God, I moaned. 
Perhaps we can check on the number of the book, the man said. Why don't you step over to my desk? But there wasn't any number on the book. I saw that, and I felt tears coming into my eyes. No, I said, no. I walked past him and started toward the doorway. One moment, sir, he called after me. I ran out and ran all the way home. I waited for the front door for Mary to come home. I'm waiting now. I'm looking at the bank book, at the line where we both signed our names, at the spaces where we had made our deposits. Fifty dollars from her parents on our first anniversary. Two hundred and thirty dollars from my veteran's insurance dividend. Twenty dollars, ten dollars, all blank. Everything is going. Jean, Sally, Mike, names fluttering away, and the people with them. Now this. What's next? Later. I know. Mary hasn't come home. I called up the office. I heard Sam answer, and I asked him if Mary was there. He said I must have the wrong number. No, Mary works there. I told him who I was. I asked him if I worked there. Stop kidding around, he said. See you Monday night. I called up my cousin, my sister, her cousin, her sister, her parents. No answer. Not even ringing. None of the numbers work. They're all gone. Sunday. I don't know what to do. All day I've been sitting in the living room looking out at the street. I've been watching to see if anybody I know comes by the house. But they don't. They're all strangers. I'm afraid to leave the house. That's all there is left. Our furniture. And our clothes. I mean, my clothes. Her closet is empty. I looked into it this morning. When I woke up, there wasn't a scrap of clothing left. It's like a magic act. Everything's disappearing. It's like... I just laughed. I must be... I called the furniture store. It's open Sunday afternoons. They said they had no record of us buying a bed. Would I like to come in and check? I hung up and looked out the window some more. I thought of calling up my aunt in Detroit, but I can't remember the number, and it isn't in my address book anymore. The entire book is blank, except for my name on the cover stamped in gold. My name, only my name. What can I say? What can I do? Everything is so simple. There's nothing to do. I've been looking at my photograph album. Almost all the pictures are different. There aren't any people on them. Mary is gone and all of our friends, our relatives. It's funny. In the wedding picture, I sit all by myself at a huge table covered with food. My left arm is out and bent as though I were embracing my bride and all along the table are glasses floating in the air, toasting me. Monday morning. I just got back the letter I sent to Jim. It has no such address stamped on the envelope. I tried to catch the mailman, but I couldn't. He was gone before I woke up. I went down to the grocer before. He knew me, but when I asked him about Mary, he said, stop kidding. I'd die a bachelor, and we both knew it. I have only one more idea. It's a risk, but I'll have to take it. I'll have to leave the house and go downtown to the Veterans Administration. I want to see if my records are there. If they are, they'll have something about my schooling, and about my marriage, and the people who are in my life. I'm taking this book with me. I don't want to lose it. If I lost it, then I wouldn't have a thing in the world to remind me that I'm not insane. Monday night. The house is gone. I'm sitting in the corner candy store. When I got back from the VA, I found an empty lot there. I asked some of the boys playing there if they knew me. They said they didn't. I asked them what happened to the house. They said they'd been playing in that empty lot since they were babies. The VA didn't have any records about me. Not a thing. That means I'm not even a person now. All I have is all I am, my body and the clothes on it. All the identification papers are gone from my wallet. My watch is gone too, just like that, from my wrist. 
it had an inscription on the back, I remember it, to my own darling, with all my love, Mary, I'm having a cup of coffee. Tom Elliott, ladies and gentlemen. Folks, it goes without saying, but I must say it anyway. Tom's podcast is the absolute top of the heap when it comes to podcasts about the Twilight Zone. And if you listen to us but not him, well, y'all need to fix that ASAP. It's easy to remember. It's called The Twilight Zone Podcast, which I probably would have called my podcast if I'd been first. But it's a really fitting name, since it really is the Twilight Zone podcast. Seek it out. Aside from its very abrupt ending, Disappearing Act works because the protagonist's gradual erasing seems to be happening for no reason at all. He doesn't theorize about why it's happening or what the larger ramifications might be for man's understanding of the basic workings of reality, and Matheson isn't interested in the hows or the whys. He's just telling the story from his protagonist's point of view, and you can do whatever you like with it. It's pretty audacious, leaving such a fundamental blank. But sometimes less really is more. The lack of detail and meditation on the supernatural element makes the situation even more unsettling somehow. In his book, Dance Macabre, Stephen King attributes the Twilight Zone success to the fact that it sets up impossible scenarios and then doesn't always explain them, much less apologize for them. So in that light, it makes perfect sense that Rod Serling would have wanted a story like a disappearing act on his show. But this was really early in the series, so maybe he wasn't completely comfortable at that point requiring such a profound suspension of disbelief from his audience. What would make me think that? Because when he adapted Matheson's story, he provided, well, not an explanation for the phenomena exactly, but at least a pretty compelling theory. And When the Sky Was Opened was the 11th episode of The Twilight Zone's first season, and it was first aired on December 11th, 1959. We start off in a darkened hangar. An aircraft of some sort is concealed beneath a large tarp. Serling fills us in on the details. This is the X-20, an experimental spaceship. During its test flight, it vanished from the radar for 24 hours and then crashed in the Mojave Desert. We dissolve to the military hospital, where Colonel Clegg Forbes arrives to visit Major William Gart. Both were on the mission. Well, hello, Colonel. How are you feeling? I'm fine, Lieutenant. I'm fine. Um, the Major Guard here? Well, of course. He's here. Of course. Now, this is a really nice moment, and one that is easily forgotten once the story starts moving. Why would Forbes ask the nurse if Gart is there? He knows Gart is there, right? I mean, where else would he be? Hmm. Gart is happy to see Forbes, but Forbes seems preoccupied, distracted, disturbed. When did I leave here? Yeah, well, don't you know? Look, I don't know anything anymore. Look, at 9.30 yesterday morning, I walked out of here, didn't I? Yeah, about that time, I guess. Who did I walk up with? Well, nobody was with you. That's what I mean. You say nobody. Forbes grabs a nearby newspaper. The headline reads, Two spacemen return from crash in desert, with a picture of the two men. Forbes remembers it differently. There were three of us in that aircraft. You and me and a colonel named Harrington. Oh, yeah, Harrington. And Harrington. Now, you look, look, he, he was 36 years old. He was my best friend. I'd known him for 15 years, and you'd known him for five. That ship took a crew of three. 
and we were the three. And there were three of us when they brought us back here to the hospital after picking us up in the desert. You and me and Harrington. Harrington and I were just scratched. You were the one with the busted leg. Yesterday morning, they discharged Harrington and me. There were three beds in this room. Yours and mine and Harrington's. Clegg, I don't know anybody named Harrington. He wasn't on the crew with us. The X-20 carried two men. You and me. Nobody named Harrington, nobody else at all. He then recounts his memory of events since the day before via your standard wavy screen flashback effect. We're in the same hospital room, but there are three men, Forbes and Gart and Colonel Ed Harrington. Forbes and Harrington are about to be discharged. We see that same newspaper, only this time the headline reads, three spacemen return from crash all alive with a photograph of all three of them. Now that night, Forbes and Gart arrive at a local bar, and Forbes wastes no time macking on the hottie sitting at the bar. And I will waste no time acknowledging said hottie's, uh, hotness. That chick that won't quit, it's like stacked, like beautiful. You got me straight tripping, boo. This unnamed beauty is played by Gloria Paul, a model, showgirl, and burlesque dancer who only acted for about 10 years. You can also find her in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Abbott and Costello Go to Mars, plus a couple of film noirs, 1957's Night of the Hunter starring Robert Mitchum and 1959's The Crimson Kimono, in which she plays a stripper who gets murdered in the very first scene. Here, she has a whopping two lines, but she's impossible not to gawk at. Say, uh, what's it like up there in outer space? Uh, well, it's it's like, uh, like, way out. Uh. Bro, so smooth. In fact, no need to ask, he's a smooth operator. You know, he'd probably make it into the elite Captain Allenby's Players Club, but alas, no pinky ring. You can't get in without it. Harrington goes to light a cigarette and his face crumbles. Something has suddenly and deeply shaken him. He drops his beer. He heads across the room to a payphone to call his parents, and he's horrified to hear them say that they never had a son named Ed, and that they don't know him at all. You know, it kind of reminds me of an old uh, Doonesbury strip uh, where Mark comes home from college and says to his dad, Hi, Dad, your son's home. To which his dad replies, Son, I have no son. I have a parasitic offspring who, year after year, manages to pass his courses just in time for me to shell out another 4000 bucks for an alleged education. Son, I have no son. What is it, Clay? What's it all mean? Well, I don't know. It's just a gag, maybe. It's always a gag in the Twilight Zone, isn't it? You know, I guess I'd probably assume the same thing, at least at first. The first stage of grief is denial. Miss Ophelia, I shouldn't be here. None of us should be here. It's as if... As if what? As if maybe we shouldn't have come back from that flight at all. Maybe somebody, something, made a mistake and let us get through we shouldn't have. Forbes goes to get Harrington another beer and spots a newspaper. It's the same paper as before, the first one we saw, with only Forbes and Gart. No Harrington. He races over to the phone booth, which is now empty. The girl at the bar and the bartender tell him that he came in alone. Now, interestingly, he doesn't immediately assume it's a gag. He immediately advances to the next stage of grief, anger. You're crazy! You're you're crazy! You're crazy! You know that? You're, You're crazy! Forbes goes home and starts making phone calls. His girlfriend Amy arrives and, wait, he has a girlfriend? 
But he was hitting on Gloria Paul at the bar? Colonel Forbes, you dog, you. Anyway, she doesn't know anyone named Ed Harrington. He gets through to a former CEO, now a general, under whom both he and Harrington serve together. The generals never heard of Ed Harrington either. And then Forbes circles back and hits that first stage of grief, denial. <laughs> I know. This is a gag, isn't it? That's what it is, isn't it, Amy? This is a gag. Oh. <laughs> this is a big, earth-shaking, <laughs> highly complicated and, <laughs> and fantastically conceived practical joke, isn't it? He's still at the bar, isn't he, Amy? That's where he is. He's still at the bar, isn't he? <laughs> He's still at the bar! Forbes goes back to the bar, which is now closed. He smashes through the front door and wanders around in the dark. The camera gradually pulls upward until we're looking directly down at him. A really nice touch. He sits inside the telephone booth and cries, hitting the third and fourth stages of grief simultaneously, bargaining and depression. Please come back. Please, Harrington. Please, Ed. Please come back. We're then back in the present in Gart's hospital room. In telling his story, Forbes seems to have achieved some level of clarity. He's been yanked out of here. He's been taken away. He told me, remember? Maybe somebody or, or something made a mistake. Let us get through when we shouldn't have gotten through. Gotta come back to get us. Oh, Bill. This is weird. It's just plain weird. Like I just don't belong. I don't belong. And there's the fifth and final stage of grief, acceptance. Now, throughout this scene, the camera has been gradually moving in for a close shot looking up at him, basically the opposite of what we saw at the end of the flashback. He looks into a nearby mirror and is horrified to see that he casts no reflection. He panics and runs out of the room. Gart jumps out of bed and limps after him, only to be intercepted by a nurse. Major, you shouldn't be out of bed. Why, if the doctor could... Somebody's got to help him. Colonel Forbes, somebody's got to help him right away. Who? Colonel Forbes! You know Colonel Forbes. Why, he was brought in here with me. She puts him back to bed and leaves to fetch the doctor. He then sees the newspaper headline, which now reads, Lone Spaceman Completes Journey Lands in Desert. He's the only one in the picture. The camera zooms in for an extreme close-up of his horrified face, then past him into the blank void of the wall. The nurse returns with the doctor. But they aren't there to check on him, because there's no one there to check on. How are we fixed in this ward here? A room 15 down here can take three patients, sir. It's empty. Let's take a look. That'll do for the malaria patients. Order some beds up from QM, will you? Yes, sir. We return to the darkened hangar from the beginning of the episode. Only now we see that the X-20 itself is gone and forgotten, too. The erasure is complete. Okay, first, I was wrong. More than just the core concept carries over from the Matheson short story. There's also the bit about the parents having no memory of their kid. And it's a powerful bit, too. The very people who gave you life don't remember you? Man, that is harsh. But otherwise, it's a completely different story. Now, while the Matheson original was essentially an existential drama, Serling's take is a sci-fi mystery, complete with a film noir flashback structure. Because it's a third-person narrative instead of a first-person account, we're given more crystal, demonstrable pieces of evidence of the phenomena. Shattered beer glasses disappear, a newspaper headline repeatedly changes, and the number of beds in the hospital room keeps shrinking until the room is finally empty. And because there's so much more precise a situation here, three men return from a failed mission and vanish one by one, Serling felt compelled to at least provide a possible explanation. 
three men who disappear one by one in chronology with an aircraft until gradually each is lost to memory. That's essentially what this short story was. Now, if you're going to say that a, the criteria that governs this is that it has to have a, 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 a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it has to have something to explain it, that's a rationale we don't require here. We have a willing suspension of disbelief going because of the nature of the program. So I wash that one by way of a criticism. I'm, I, I have a poetic license here to say that all one man needs say is that there is something or someone who says that we shouldn't have come back, and that's all I require. Now, if on the other hand, you feel emotionally left out, uh, if you feel cheated by that statement, then I've, I've, I've done something improper. If you can't believe the unbelievability, then there's something wrong in the writing. My feeling here was that the bizarre quality of what occurred so outshadowed the required rationale that it wasn't, you know, we didn't have to worry about it. Maybe somebody, something made a mistake and let us get through we shouldn't have. So if we go with that, and really that's all we have to go on, who is the someone or something? Aliens? So maybe they intended to capture the aircraft, maybe to study it and the human specimens inside, but it somehow slipped through their presumably long reptilian fingers. Well, actually, that doesn't make sense, since uncreating their quarry kind of makes further research impossible. And how would they even do this to begin with? Selectively erase both people and objects, not to mention the collective memory of the entire population of the Earth, or at least the civilized world. Remember, this was 1960, so the eyes of the world would have been on the X-20 test flight. Do they have some kind of reality eraser? Because, hell, that would be a really cool thing to have. You can keep your sonic screwdriver, Doctor Who. I want to get me a reality eraser. Patent pending. Another cool little detail. We never actually see the X-20. It's hidden under a tarp, and the next time we're in the hangar, it's gone. It's like a blink and you'll miss it kind of thing. Not sure it was intentional, but somehow never seeing the ship makes it easier to accept that it was never there at all. Now, here's a theory I've never seen anyone put forward, maybe because it's too goofy, I don't know. What we're seeing is a ripple effect as the space-time continuum accommodates a change in the timeline. Like maybe somebody went back in time and changed something, which had the eventual effect of eliminating the X-20 program and its associated astronauts. A Ray Bradbury, Sound of Thunder kind of deal. Like Martin Sloan going back in time and injuring his younger self, resulting in a limp that he has when he returns to the present. Yeah, I know, the theory doesn't hold much water. What's the common element in all three astronauts' lives, plus the X-20 itself, that would erase all of them? What single change in the past would target such specific things in the future? Or maybe it's necessary to eliminate everything connected to the X-20 program. Maybe it's those long-fingered reptilian aliens trying to prevent humankind from venturing out into space. They went back in time and pre-sabotaged the space program, which necessitated eliminating everyone connected to the X-20. And maybe it doesn't stop with the astronauts and the ship. Maybe the scientists and mechanics who worked on it are gone too, and with them any hope of man ever exploring space. I wonder if Forbes, Gart, and Harrington were really uncreated and erased, or if they were simply removed from Earth's memory and are now... where? In an alien zoo? Maybe it's a Slaughterhouse-Five slash X-Files alien abduction kind of thing. And the aliens are so paranoid about being discovered that they go to great lengths to prevent any possible suspicion. Remember those memory-wiping flash pens from Men in Black? Maybe they're using something like that on a planetary scale. Maybe they somehow hijacked the sun and added a very specific amnesia ray to the heat and light that it's already putting out, so they can wipe out entire time zones in a single shot. Now, the other possible explanation, and I hesitate to go here, is that that old rascal God himself did it. Or herself? Itself? I actually talked about this sort of thing in my blog when I covered the season four episode, The Parallel. 
which is probably the closest thing to a bookend episode for And When the Sky Was Opened in the entire series. I probably should have covered it this week too, but it's an hour-long episode, so this would have been like three hours long, with the Tom Elliott segment and the music segment still to come. Anyway, without recounting the intricacies of the plot of the parallel, I'll just say that an astronaut crosses over into a parallel Earth, which opens up all kinds of weird story problems until the very end, when everything is just sort of magically fixed by unknown and unexplained means. I'm by no means religious, but divine intervention is literally the only explanation. It doesn't really apply here, unless a successful X-20 mission would have led to some kind of massive disaster in the future, so God gently massaged the timeline to avoid it. But if God is all-powerful and controls everything, and there's a grand design to it all, why would he ever have to go in and retcon history? And therein lies a flip and Pandora's box of predetermination versus free will ruminating, and I'm not doing that right now. Here's something interesting. Years later, Serling taught a writing class at Ithaca College, where he presented select episodes of The Twilight Zone and discussed their shortcomings with the class. And some of his students were really sharp. For example, why was there a tarp on the hangar floor after the X-20 disappeared? If it never existed, then the tarp wouldn't have been there at all, right? But then we had, uh, why did we have the barricade? The barricade. Yeah, around the aircraft. Yeah. 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 And why the tarp? I mean, that really bothered me. Ah, very good, very good. Why was the tarp so neatly folded? Two weeks from tonight, I'm going to come in here <laughs> with an altogether rational response to that dumb, dumb question, and you're going to be so embarrassed, saying, what did I think of that? That's what you're going to say. At the moment, Jesus Christ, I can't think of any reason why they put a goddamn thing there on the ground and they barricaded it. I think they, that, eventually, that originally was the site of the Hope Diamond. They used to have that right there. <laughs> and they used to guard it, you know. Uh, the Hope Diamond. Good. And as long as we're eavesdropping on Serling's class, his recollections of Matheson's short story are very interesting. Now keep in mind that when Dick Matheson first wrote this story, it had nothing to do with astronauts. It was just a guy who asked his friend to join him for cocktails. And they're sitting in a cocktail bar, and his friend makes mention of the fact that he looks very haggard. What's the matter? And he says, I want to show you something. And he takes out a snapshot. And he says, who's in the picture? He says, well, yeah, it's your wife and, and your son. He says, where's my two daughters? He says, there aren't, what do you mean, two? you never had two daughters. And this is the way it happens until Friday when the guy goes back to the saloon and there's no one. I felt that there was no rationale there. At least if I'm dealing in outer space, I can say something, someone, and I've got a little bit more going. In the original short story, there was nothing going. Interesting indeed. Also really inaccurate. But hey, I'm about the same age that Serling was at the time, and my memory is terrible. But on a side note, wouldn't it be amazing to attend a class taught by Rod Serling, to actually interact with him, to shake his hand, to thank him for the gift of the Twilight Zone, which we're still enjoying and talking about all these years later. And When the Sky Was Open was directed by Douglas Hayes, who also directed last week's The After Hours. But since we don't go chronological, this one was actually produced and aired before The After Hours. In fact, And When the Sky was his very first Twilight Zone out of the total nine that he would ultimately direct. Hayes seemed to be the go-to guy when an episode called for a little something extra, like maybe a more elaborate production design. Here's the Hayes list in chronological order. In season one, And When the Sky Was Opened, Elegy, The Chaser, The After Hours. In season two, Nervous Man in a Four Dollar Room, The Howling Man, The Eye of the Beholder, Dust, and The Invaders. And that's it. He didn't direct anything in seasons three, four, and five. I have no idea why, but honestly, it's the show's loss. His work is consistently top tier. And come on, Eye of the Beholder? Not only is that probably the greatest episode of the entire series, it's one of the greatest things ever produced for television, and he directed it. 
He's probably best remembered now for his Twilight Zone work, but Mystery Science Theater 3000 fans probably know him for his 1964 opus, Kitten with a Whip, which he wrote and directed. He also had the courtesy to cast the stunning Anne Margaret. <sighs> a girl under 18 running scared, a fugitive. But you take her in, sure. You tuck her into bed, you give her money, you buy her clothes. For what? Because he's so shiny bright in a big white hat? Or because you're a dirty creep whose wife is out of town? Not just a creep, but a sick creep. That's how I'll tell it. That's what started me screaming. Because you're sick! Film composer Leonard Rosenman only contributed original music to one Twilight Zone episode, and it just happens to be And When the Sky Was Opened. And if we're gonna talk music, then we really should bring in the expert. Music professional. <laughs> Hello. Doc! Doc! Hey, what's up? It's Greg. Hey, how are you? I'm all right. And you're saying I'm well. Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, so we are talking about And When the Sky Was Opened. Um, and I just happened to notice that it's got an original music score, and I thought I should probably check in with you about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, Leonard Rosenman? Yes. If I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And... Um, this is the only uh, the only uh, score that he contributed to the Twilight Zone. Yes, um, and I can go on and on and on about Leonard Rosenman. Um, in fact, I'm do. kind of working. Well, I'm not kind of. I am working on a project um, for a, a book that will be coming out at some point. Um, oh. Filled with essays about film and television composers. And their double life of being concert composers as well. Hmm. Uh, and so I'm working on the Leonard Rosenman chapter. Um, and oh, wow. I have been looking through Leonard Rosenman's manuscript scores uh, for his concert music. Uh, I have been in contact with his wife, Judy Gregg Rosenman, who is absolutely lovely. Oh. Uh, and so I'm beginning a, a, a really big picture as to what Rosenman was doing most of his life. He never really wanted to do film music. Um, what people don't realize about Rosenman is that he was very good friends with James Dean. He actually lived with James Dean at one point. Uh, wow. He got his start in film because James Dean was his piano student, and he was doing <laughs> Rebel Without the Walls. And he said, hey, you know, the director's looking for a composer, and I know you write music. He's like, I, I don't write film music. He's like, no, just do it. You'll make some money. It'll be great. Um, and he finally caved, and he did it. And from then on, kind of like, as I say, the rest of history, he kept getting asked to write film compo compositions. But the problem was is that his heart was never really in it. Uh, and so when he was the, – the problem with Hollywood, especially back then was that in the 50s, was that – if you composed for film and TV, you were considered a sellout if you were a concert composer. So once he scored Rebel, he didn't get his concert music performed for about another 20 years. Oh, wow. He, as he said in one interview in the New York Times, it actually drove him into therapy because he was just so depressed by this. Wow. But he was, he was the very first person to write a film score uh, in what we call 12-tone. Uh, so if you look at a piece of, if you look at music, mm -hmm. um, music really has from uh, within the octave, which is say from C to C, um, 12 pitches, mm -hmm. including what we call half steps or chromatics. Uh, and with 12 tone music, what happens is you technically are not supposed to reuse one pitch um, until you use the other 11 in the sequence and you can make that sequence whatever you want. Uh, and there are various variations to it. Um, you can do it backwards, you can do it forward, you can do it upside down and backwards, you could do it top to bottom. We put it in a square called a matrix, 
uh, which is a 12 by 12 square that sort of tells you what pitches are in that sequence and how they go. Mm-hmm. So um, Rosenman was a very big 12-tone composer. Um, he loved writing 12-tone music. He studied with Arnold Schoenberg, who was really the pioneer of 12-tone music. Uh, and so he used a lot of his film music as a laboratory for his concert music. And a lot of his concert music somehow the motives would sometimes find their way in between um, the concert music and the actual um, film score he's working on. Mm -hmm. So at the time he was working on uh, I Shot uh, When And When the Sky Was Opened, Mm -hmm. he was also doing two other things. Um, He was writing a piece called Chamber Music Number One, uh, and he was also writing a film score called The Savage Eye, uh, which is not a very well-known film. Um, it is probably the strangest film I have ever seen in my entire life. Wow. Uh, it, it, it's very, very bizarre. Um, and so in listening to the score for The Savage Eye, um, I hear a lot of the motives that were used in And When the Sky Was Opened. In fact, And When the Sky Was Opened was a 12-tone score that he actually wrote for television. Um, And if you have my book, uh, you can take a look and see the matrix that I constructed so you can get an idea of what this matrix looks like, the 12 by 12 square. Uh, I don't know necessarily if he... uh, People said that he actually reused some of the music from The Savage Eye in Chamber Music Number 1 and vice versa. Um, There are no commercial recordings for it. Uh, Uh Judy Greg Rosenman may possibly have a reference recording somewhere. Um, if she does, it's probably on a tape. And we know what happens with tapes, um, especially <laughs> in the 50s. Yeah. So I, unless I actually go and, and the chamber music number one score, if I remember correctly, is at least 150 pages. Oh, wow. Um, so, I'm, and I, ha- I, I have looked at all of his scores because NYU has them, thank God. Hmm. Uh, and that's one of the places that I teach. So it's really nice to have a four-hour break when you can go and hang out in the archives <laughs> for that four hours. Um, but unless I actually compare in detail the score for Chamber Music Number 1 with the score from um, the and When the Sky Was Opened, um, hmm. I can't entirely be sure. Um, the Savage Eye score, I believe, is actually out in California. His, his hmm. film scores and his... Uh, for most of his film scores uh, are at NYU. Some of them are not. Um, Rebel Without a Cause is at NYU, a couple of others, but um, Savage Eye is not. Mm. Uh, so there's no way for me to compare that. Uh, but there was a dissertation that was done um, by someone named Jessica Payette, who uh, talked about Schoenberg and his students, and she specifically talks about um, the Savage Eye and Chamber Music Number 1, and how a lot of that oh, music wow. was No, I chewed your ear off. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I've got plenty of ears to be chewed. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I've I've said before uh, on the show lots of times. I'm a huge Bernard Herrmann fan. Um, you know, there are uh, certainly other film composers that I I'm interested in. I mean, you know, I, I like a lot of Jerry Goldsmith's early stuff. Um. Rosenman's not one that I've ever really explored, but I'm actually, as we're talking, I'm pulling up his IMDb page and yeah, he did, I mean, some pretty notable stuff. I mean, in the genre, he did fantastic voyage in 1966. Um, he did, uh, star Trek mm-hmm. four, yeah. um, which depending on what kind of Trekkie you are, it's either one of the best films or one of the worst. Uh, right. <laughs> I, the cool thing- so is if you thank God for like sites like archive.org and things like that, mm. um, because if you are interested in hearing him talk uh, about his compositional process um, mm. and his experience with writing film and TV stuff and concert music and even hearing some performances of his concert works, um, there oh. are two interviews. Um, one was um, called, I believe it's called Sunday Morning Concerts. Uh, by Charles Amakamian. Uh, it's a two-part, it's like a two-hour thing, and it has some of his um, recordings of pieces like Foci 1 and his Chamber Music 4, which is actually a double a double bass concerto 
that is composed using um, what you call um, yeah, quarter tones. Uh, and then there's also a talk he gave in California, I believe it was U- at USC. Um, only the first half of that is preserved. Uh, the other half is gone, thanks to tape. Um, but if you go on like archive.org and search Leonard Rosenman, those things will come up and you can hear those audio recordings and interviews of him and things like that. Uh-huh. Um, his film music and his concert music are very, very very different. Um, and in fact, that book that I had my essay going into, um, there also will be, not by me, but by someone else, a chapter on Bernard Herrmann, ah. um, one on Franz Voxman. So a lot of the Twilight Zone composers will be making an appearance in that book. Um, so it sounds like I'm going to need to put a, a link in the show notes <laughs> yeah. to the, to the, the archives. Um, I just noticed, again, as I'm looking at the interview, he did two Planet of the Apes movies. He did Beneath the Planet of the Apes and The Battle for the Planet of the Apes, which which were the last two in the original five-film Planet of the Apes series. Uh, The reason that I'm excited to see that is because uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I talked a little bit about Planet of the Apes on the podcast. uh, Because uh, when we covered uh, I Shot an Arrow into the Air and the Rip Van Winkle caper, both of those kind of contributed story elements to Serling's screenplay for Planet of the Apes. Um, So everything is connected, Doc. Everything is connected. It's wonderful. (laughs) It's wonderful. Um, So uh, Savage Eye uh, is a... It's kind of a semi-documentary. Kind of... (laughs) It's it is a hard thing to even discuss. Um, yeah. In it's, fact, if you ask me what it's about, all I know is it's about this woman who got divorced. Right, and the <laughs> actress who plays her is Barbara Baxley, uh, who was in at least one Twilight Zone, maybe two. Yeah, she's the mute. She's the hysterical foster mom in Mute. Yeah. Right. And, uh, uh, there's also some Gary Merrill in there. I think he just narrates. I don't think he. I don't know that he's actually seen in there. No, uh, he's not. But uh, yeah, it's 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 really hard to follow. I mean, I don't really know. I, I I like to know like what something's about, and I don't know what this is about. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, I, I I get that there's some arc about this divorced woman, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think the music is probably the most interesting part of it for me, um, and there is absolutely some overlap between Rosenman's Rosenman's score for the Savage Eye and in when the sky was open. Um, you were kind enough to forward me a YouTube clip, uh, that, that kind of demonstrates that. Uh, and I'm actually, uh, as soon as we get off here, I'm actually going to play a chunk of, and when the sky was opened with a chunk of the Savage Eye, because there is this one section and again, I'm using fra- terms like section, like that's not a musical term. <laughs> well, it <laughs> because can be. I'm, I'm not a musician. Well, like a section of the orchestra, but that's, you know, okay. that's not what I, there's a chunk, a chunk. Yeah. There's a chunk of it that sounds like the other one. So I'm going to yes. play them both so people know that I'm not crazy. <laughs> because, well, the Savage Eyes, it's not an easy thing to track down. Um, no, it's- you know, there's that clip of it on YouTube that's, I don't know, like, 10 minutes of it maybe uh and then they're like isolated little clips of like one minute each or something right um but as far as like actually tracking it down uh i tracked it down through unsavory means Uh, (laughs) which i mean in a lot of ways for 50s and 60s tv there's really only one way to do that and that is through unsavory means yeah so so and then i i you know I implicated you in, in my cyber crime by sending you a copy of it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm so getting arrested <laughs> now that I've put this out there. <laughs> oh, who we can? Nobody's listening to this. Nobody's hearing this. Oh. <laughs> um, but, uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, I, I, think, I think it may have come out on DVD at some point a long time ago. Uh, but it's out of print. I wasn't able because I w- I was gonna just buy it if I could find it. Uh, I wasn't able to track it down. Um, so if the listeners haven't seen it, um, you'll just have to trust us when we say 
it's bizarre. <laughs> it's not necessarily Twin Peaks, the new series, episode eight, bizarre, but it's <laughs> it's definitely it's something. It's something bizarre in another way. Some something I don't know. I don't know. Uh, anyway, yeah. So um, the Rosenman score for "And When the Sky Was Open," uh, you know, it's one of those perennials. Every time the Twilight Zone, you know, gets released or re-released, the soundtracks, it's always there. It was, it was on the vinyl in the '80s. It was on the CD in the '90s. Uh, then they put that. There's like a box set, like the 40th anniversary four disc box set which just repeats all of the previously released material. Right. Uh, it's also isolated on the Blu-ray and the DVD, so it's easy to track that music down. Um, and it's a great score. If we can just briefly touch on the actual score, um, mm-hmm. it's... it's uh, we, we talked when we talked about the, uh, the Mofar murder, uh, you, know, you, you characterized it as kind of creepy. There are definitely some creepy aspects to the score here. Um, but a lot of it, I find, and I don't, I don't mean this to sound critical when I say I don't, I don't mean this as, as it's flat, but it's, it's very. I don't want to quite say it's ambient either, but it's sort of just, oh man. It, uh, I'm, I'm probably gonna cut this part out, because <laughs> I'm fucking it up. Um, it. I don't hear a lot of like discernible like melody. I mean, it seems no. just it's very. Um, I don't want to call it wallpaper music either because it's not that, and it's definitely it definitely asserts itself when it needs to. Um, you know, whenever things kind of escalate, like when one of the astronauts is you know nearing their disappearance, you know, definitely you know there's a lot of like piano that comes in, and it's it's very propulsive and it's very. Um, but it's nothing like, say, uh, King Nine Will Not Return, right? Which, which is just a blatant, like, in-your-face, scary music fest. You know, this one is very—it's very subtle. I mean, maybe that's the word I'm looking for. It's just—it's a oh. subtle score, and yet, it's—it definitely punctuates what's going on very effectively. All right. So a little primer on. 12 tone music. So Arnold Schoenberg, who created 12 tone music, and I'm using created very loosely here, um, he came up with the idea because he said that all music that came before him, um, which was grounded in what we call tonality, meaning that uh, when you have a piece of music, you can hear exactly where you are, um, what key center you're in. So if I were to play a piece of music, uh, even if you're not a musician, you probably would be able to sing for me the final note if you hear a passage. Uh, and that's what we call tonality. And Schoenberg said that that's old and it's outdated and we've done everything that we possibly could do with that. Now it's time for something new. And so he said, what happens if we take all of the 12 pitches within this sequence um, and play around with them such that no one note is more important than the other. So you can't have any sort of tonal grounding. And that's what we call atonal music. So really with atonal music, what you have is music that has no sense of, of place. You don't know where you are, you don't know where you've been, and you don't know where you're going. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, having a 12-tone score for And When the Sky Was Opened is actually really appropriate because you have these three astronauts who slowly disappear one by one, and they're not sure where they are. They're not sure if what they're experiencing is reality. They're not sure if they're going to be the next one to disappear. Um, and so you sort of get this this apprehension about it, this, you know, this idea of, of sending a telegram where I know I wrote my name and someone else's, but why is my mm-hmm. name the only one on it? Mm-hmm. And not knowing what's real and what's not. So that's really the first thing. The other thing is that with 12 to with, not necessarily with 12 to music, um, I know I've talked about this with uh, Steiner's score for King Nine, where you have a repeated bass line um, mm-hmm. called an ostinato. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have that ostinato in... in and when the sky was opened as well. Uh, and 
it sort of builds this tension because it's not a tonal ostinato. And again, you have no sense of place and you have no grounding and you're also stuck in this situation where you can't get out of it. Uh, so in a lot of ways, really, Rosenman was the ideal composer for this because he was so well-versed in not only writing for film and TV, but also for uh, writing 12-tone music. That's really genius. I mean, just to, I mean, actually have, you know, the, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to use whacking on musical terms here, uh, but using, you know, a, a style of music or a, 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 a way of composing that actually mirrors the action on the screen, not just, you know, you know, providing like some kind of emotional, you know, subliminal resonance to something but actually the form of the music itself is actually reflective exactly of, of the plot so that's that's kind of genius that's that's amazing um well doc as always thank you for uh being available for my um musically ignorant questions and um for legitimizing what we do here um you know uh you know, I'm sure I've said this in the past, but you are, you know, you are uh, a doctor of musicology. You know what you're talking about. I often do not know what I'm talking about. So you're kind of the brains. So I appreciate I'm your the help. brains, you're the brawn. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Teresa might argue the brawn thing. I, I, I don't know. I think she, she she's the She's the pants wearer in this family. But um, uh, so um, uh, Reba's book is A Dimension of Sound Music in the Twilight Zone. It is available uh, wherever fine books are sold, I think, um, online anyway. I, I know mm -hmm. Amazon has it. And it will be coming out, both that and the Outer Limits book will be coming out as ebooks. Ooh. So there you go. So all of you who have issued paper and are now on your Kindles can also read this book. Both books are great. Um, you know, they're written in a way that someone like me can actually follow it. Um, but, but it's not dumbed down either. I mean, you know, it's some of it's very technical, but, but Reba has this great way of, of kind of presenting a lot of information. And I, I didn't, I mean, I've read both. I didn't feel like I was drowning. Um, it wasn't like watching Twin Peaks episode eight. How about that? <laughs> so see, see how I brought that around. See, there you go. Though it's probably not as impressive if I point out that I brought it around. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Doc, as always, thank you for your time and your assistance. My pleasure. All right, catch you later. Yep. All right, bye. Okay, so here's a clip from the Savage Eye score. And here's Celestial Call number three, the cue from And When the Sky Was Opened. Yeah, those are pretty similar. Almost uh, 
uncomfortably so. Heading up the cast of And When the Sky Was Opened as Colonel Clegg Forbes is that Aussie rascal, the thunder from down under, Rod Taylor. Of course, I used to smoke, which I don't anymore. And so uh, I didn't bother learning anything for the part. But everybody smoked on that set, I'm telling you that right now. On every set in those days. It was 1959 which, by the way, was only five years after I arrived in this country from Aussie, from Australia. Genre fans, of course, know him from 1960's The Time Machine, which is now available on Blu-ray from Warner Home Video. It was disconcerting to see the sun arc in less than a minute. To see a snail race by, my flowers flinging wide their petals to embrace the new day, and the hours speeding across the face of my sundial and the flowers closing their eyes for the night. It was wonderful. Not to mention Alfred Hitchcock's 1963 classic, The Birds, which is now available on Blu-ray from Universal Studios Home Entertainment. Yes, what is it you're looking for, sir? Lovebirds. Lovebirds, sir? Yes, I understand there are different varieties. Is that true? Oh, yes, there are. Well, uh, these are for my sister for her birthday, you see, and uh, as she's only going to be 11, I, I wouldn't want a pair of birds that were... Too demonstrative. I understand completely. Uh, at the same time, I wouldn't want them to be too aloof either. No, of course not. Do you happen to have a pair of birds that are this friendly? Oh, I think so. And in between those, he provided the voice of Pongo the dog in Disney's 101 Dalmatians in 1961, now available on Blu ray from Disney Home Video. At that time, I lived with my pet in a bachelor flat just off Regent's Park. It was a beautiful spring day tedious time of the year for bachelors. Oh, that's my pet, Roger. Roger Radcliffe. A musician of sorts. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm the one with the spots. My name's Pongo. His final role was as Winston Churchill in 2009's Inglorious Bastards, which is now available on Blu-ray from Universal Studios Home Entertainment. You say he wants to take on the Jews at their own game? Well, compared to, say, Louis B. Mayer. How's he doing? Now, just so we're clear, I'm not trying to provide free advertising for the studios. With all the streaming going on these days, I'm just trying to do my part to support and promote physical media in an age when streaming is increasingly exerting its dominance in the home video market. Why buy a virtual movie that lives in a cloud that might blow away at some point when you can own an actual physical disc? I mean, I get it for renting, I watch on-demand stuff fairly regularly, but owning a movie I can't touch or put on my movie shelf isn't ownership at all. You send me a wire that you're going to meet me at the bus station at 12 o'clock tonight. Well, I was there at 12, and I was there at 1, and I was still there at 2. Do you have any idea how many bars I've been to? How many motels? Amy, please! Also in the cast is Maxine Cooper as Forbes' girlfriend, Amy. I never made the connection before now, but she's Mike Hammer's Girl Friday in the 1955 film noir Kiss Me Deadly. First you find a little thread. A little thread leads you to a string. And the string leads you to a rope. And from the rope you hang by the neck. Now, the cute nurse... Hello, nurse! ...is played by Sue Randall in the first of her three Twilight Zone appearances. Well, hello, Colonel. How are you feeling? I'm fine, Lieutenant. I'm, I'm fine. Um, the Major Guard here? Well, of course. He's here. She'll also play a taxidermied beauty contestant, well, sort of, in Elegy, also in season one, which we'll be covering soon, and Millie, that fickle minx in season five's From Agnes With Love, which we'll probably... Never cover, because I hate it so much. Now let's see, did I leave anybody out? Oh, I'm gonna let you have it, fresh punk kid. Oh, I'm gonna <laughs> fix this baby's wagon. I'm gonna tell the medics that he's a very sick cookie and ought to be kept under observation for another seven years. And every Saturday night, Major Gart, the Colonel and I are gonna phone you from whatever bar we happen to be in at the time, and if you're nice. If you are real nice. We'll even let you talk to our women. 
Right. Colonel Ed Harrington is played by Charles Aidman, and he'll come back again in season three for Little Girl Lost. I saved him for last so I could segue seamlessly into this next bit. And okay, I guess it's not so seamless if I point it out. Why do I keep doing that? When CBS brought back The Twilight Zone in 1985, Rod Serling wasn't uh, available to reprise his services as host and narrator. They opted to use an off-camera narrator, and they went with Charles Aidman. So for the year and a half the new Twilight Zone was on CBS, he had the unenviable job of reminding people that he wasn't Rod Serling every time a new episode started or ended. And that's not to disparage his work. He actually has a really soothing yet somewhat authoritative voice. And he's light years better than Forrest Whitaker was when he was the on-camera host and narrator for the second new Twilight Zone series on UPN in 2002. I like Forrest Whitaker at all. He was just seriously miscast. It's just awkward to watch. Now, on February 21st, 1987, the new Twilight Zone presented an episode called The Card, which wasn't a remake of And When the Sky Was Open, but, well, you'll see in a sec. Hey, here's old Charlie Aidman now. The devil, they say, having so far failed to destroy the human race with nuclear weapons, toxic waste, or elevator music, has finally devised his most cunning weapon. Long-term credit with fine print written in the Twilight Zone. Linda Wolf checks in for an appointment at the offices of The Card. It seems that despite her spotty credit record, The Card is offering to extend her some credit. What do you know about our card? Nothing. uh, Until your call, I'd never heard of you. Well, let's say that we understand that modern life cannot be conducted on a cash basis. So we offer credit to those who can't get it anywhere else. You're the credit card of last resort. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, but because of that, we have some very stringent and unusual requirements. For example, we insist on a minimum payment within seven days of purchase, as opposed to the usual 30 days. That's kind of rough, isn't it? Most of our cardholders don't seem to mind. It's a small percentage, sort of a good faith gesture. But there are severe penalties and service charges. They're all spelled out right here in the cardholders' agreement. What do you say? She signs. Her card has already been generated and it's ready for her to use. It's like they knew she'd bite. She immediately treats herself to an expensive bottle of perfume and her husband is a bit concerned. What credit card is this? That's my new credit card. Oh, really? Are we going to start fighting about Linda's problem again? No, no, I don't think that'd be a good idea at all. Good. Please. I need to be careful. Oh, Brian, come on. Recognize that voice? Sure you do. That's William Atherton playing a good guy for a change. He played Henry Corwin's dickish boss in the new Twilight Zone's Night of the Meek remake. But of course, we all know him best as the dickish TV reporter Richard Thornburg in Die Hard. All right, all right, all right. Get back, get back. No, all right, all right. No, Esther. Look, you let me in right now or I call the INS. Comprende? Look, this is the last time these kids are going to have to speak to their parents. So it seems Linda's gotten them into some financial trouble in the past. Now, one week later, uh uh-oh, she forgot to make the required minimum payment within seven days, and inexplicably, her cat has disappeared. But worse than that, nobody but her remembers him. Linda, what is all this about a cat? What do you mean, what is all this about a cat? Linda, I cannot get them a cat. I'm allergic to cats. Well, I know. That's why we keep him on the porch. You got a cat? For God's sakes, Brian, have you lost your mind? <laughs> All right, if we don't have a cat, then tell me what's been eating out of this cat dish and sleeping on this ratty old cushion. <sighs> oh, I get it. This is someone's idea of a joke. Very funny, Brian. Really, very funny. Ha! It's got to be a gag. It's nice to see some things carry over from the original zone to the new zone. Now, meanwhile, at the card office... It's the Linda Wolf account. I know you made an acquisition. She's late again. Exercise your option. (laughs) So the cat was acquired, 
as a penalty for a late payment. And she's still delinquent? What's it gonna take, Linda? Where's the dog anyway? You guys got him out on the porch? It's fine, I can't got your tongue. Where's the dog? What dog? Evan Wolf, stop playing games. Mom, I'm not playing games. Well, somebody's playing games. First Boris disappears and now Scooby. Scooby? Rut row. Is this a credit card bill for the refrigerator? I thought you had to make a payment within a week. So? So we bought the refrigerator eight days ago. Three of those days were weekends, honey. They can't count that. I wouldn't be too sure about that. So Linda swears she won't use the card again. However, the next day her car breaks down, so she's forced to whip it out yet again. Meanwhile, at the card office... Yes? She used it even though she was delinquent? No. No, no, we have no choice. Do it now. Linda goes home to her family of five, except now... Something's happened to the boys' rooms. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, honey. The baby! Brian, stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! I need my one, my children! Stop it! Linda, stop. We don't have any children. We never had any children. We don't have a cat. We don't have a dog. Linda realizes that those godless monsters at the card are behind it all. She goes to their offices to confront them about their penalty system, just in time to see her three kids disappear behind a door. I mean, they don't actually disappear, they're just spirited away. Okay, not like the Studio Ghibli film. I mean, uh, never mind. They're gone. Yes, those were your children. Earlier this week, we acquired your cat and your dog. What seems to be the problem? What oh, seems to be the problem? You just taking my children away from me and no one even remembers that I had them. Look, we acquire the experiential matrix along with the principal. It wouldn't be fair to give someone a cat what or a person without saying? the accompanying memories, would it? What kind of people are you? Well, you said it yourself. We are the credit card of last resort. Now, you signed a business agreement oh. with us. Oh. And you failed to make the good faith payments, and we collected. It's all in the cardholder agreement. I don't give a damn about your cardholder agreement! It's something for the moment that I even understood what you people are capable of doing that doesn't make it right! You can't just take someone's children away. We can take anything we like, Mrs. Wolf, oh, as long as you fail to make the minimum payment. Linda writes a check to cover the balance owed in a desperate bid to get her kiddos back. She's warned that if the check bounces, she'll face yet another penalty. She races home. Oh, Brian, thank God you're home. I had to do something today, honey. Where the hell have you been? I wrote a check on the joint account. I know. The bank called me. Linda, why don't you talk to me? What did you do? What did you do at the bank? I canceled the check. No! No! She races outside. Her car vanishes. She goes back inside. Her furniture begins vanishing, and she watches in horror as Brian, her husband, vanishes from a photograph. Finally, all that's left in the house is the card lying on the floor. Linda grabs a pair of scissors and cuts it in half, at which point the entire house, and her with it, disappears. So we have the erasing of people and only one person remembering them and then that person ultimately disappears too. I guess when you boil it down like that, it does sound like a knockoff or at least a semi-remake of And When the Sky Was Open, but I don't really see it as such. The credit card penalty angle is interesting, plus it's only at the end that things and people actually vanish. Up till then, it's just the company repossessing them. And that experiential matrix thing kind of sounds like the reality eraser. Patent pending. I think all in all, the card is different enough to stand on its own. However. Last week, I extolled the praises of the 80s syndicated anthology TV series, Tales from the Dark Side. And I do stand by my assertion that Everybody Needs a Little Love is one of that series' greatest episodes. But here's an example of me falling on the opposite end of the judgment spectrum. I speak, of course, of the episode Slippage, which is a blatant and unapologetic ripoff of Matheson's disappearing act, and by association, and when the sky was opened. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Rant 
Now, maybe my criticism shouldn't be leveled at the episode as produced. Maybe I should be directing my ire at the short story upon which it is based, which is written by Michael P. Cube McDowell. Unlike the massive changes in translating disappearing act to the screen, slippage is more or less the same on print and on screen, so this synopsis will cover both. And out of spite, I'm not playing any clips. So strange things are happening to Richard Hall. A computer glitch removes him from his employer's payroll system so he doesn't get his paycheck. He misses his high school reunion because he apparently wasn't invited. All the mail in his mailbox is suddenly addressed to his wife, Elaine. Nothing comes for him. He tries to call old friends, but apparently all of them have changed their numbers. He finally goes to his mother's house, and she doesn't recognize him. Suspecting something nefarious is going on, he holds up in a motel. His best friend Chris tracks him down and convinces him to come home, but he's different somehow. Resigned. On the drive back, Richard vanishes. Chris apologizes to Elaine for losing him, but she has no idea who Richard is. Richard who? asks Chris, and they kiss. Now, you heard Tom read the Richard Matheson story earlier. Seriously, how is this any different? Okay, the names are different, but really, it's exactly the same story. What's really disappointing is Slippage was first published in, of all places, Twilight Zone magazine. Jesus, of all the magazines that should have immediately recognized the extreme similarity. See, it kind of legitimizes the offense when Twilight Zone magazine pays actual money for a story that blatantly rips off one of the original Twilight Zone inner circle of writers. I mean, I'm not crazy, right? Guy starts to notice his place in the world is becoming increasingly tenuous to the point where everyone he's ever known and loved has no memory of him, and then he himself disappears entirely. Which story am I talking about? Either one, because it's the same goddamn story! So do we blame Tales from the Dark Side for buying the story and adapting it? After all, Twilight Zone magazine printed it, so it must be original, right? And it's actually not a bad episode, technically speaking. But that's really a testimony to the genius of Richard Matheson. Even a pale imitation of brilliance is still kind of shiny. So do we blame Mikey McDowell? I don't know. I suppose there's a chance he never saw And When the Sky Was Opened, much less read Matheson's original story. I mean, it's kind of unlikely, but you never know. So do we cast a withering stink eye at whoever was the managing editor of Twilight Zone magazine in 1982? I don't know. Maybe that individual saw it as a kind of tribute. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery or whatever. Maybe who's to blame isn't really important 35 years later. It happened. It's shitty. Richard Matheson's gone now. But God, I'd love to talk to him and get his take on it. When I covered And When the Sky Was Opened in my blog back in 2009 on its 50th anniversary, I stated for the record, and since it's the internet, it's permanent, that it was one of my top 10 favorite episodes. I usually don't assign numerical ratings or letter grades, but most of the time I can confidently rattle off a top 10 or top 20 list. But it's by no means a scientific system, and my tastes do tend to mutate a bit over time. Now today, Eight years after And When the Sky Was Opened was a top 10 favorite, well, I'm not 100% sure I'd still put it in my top 10, but it wouldn't be far off if I didn't. Top 20, definitely. I love this episode. It's that rare sterling effort that isn't pushing a moral, subtle or otherwise, or commenting on the human condition. It's just a tale well told, adapted from a different, but at a molecular level very similar, tale well told. The cast is great, the photography is great, the babe at the bar is great. It's all great. Now, this is only one of two Richard Matheson short stories that were bought for The Twilight Zone and adapted by Serling. After that, Matheson adapted his own stories. The other Serling Matheson adaptation was Third from the Sun, which is another all-time favorite of mine. 
That one's way more similar to the original story, incidentally. We'll get to it soonish. A little housekeeping now before we wrap things up for the week. Shame. Oh no. Shame. Shame. Wrong. It's a mistake. Dumbass. So once again, I provided erroneous information in a recent episode, for which I must atone. Two weeks ago, I said that Rod Serling paid Madeline Champion $500 for her story idea, which led to I Shot an Arrow into the Air. Now, I didn't just pull that out of my ass. Mark Scott Zickery reported that in The Twilight Zone Companion. However, Martin Grahams Jr., author of The Twilight Zone Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic, disagrees. According to Rod's brother, Robert Serling, Madeline Champion proposed the story idea during dinner at Rod's house. He paid her back with a new refrigerator. There were no agents involved with the deal, since it had been handled personally by Rod and John Champion, and the literary assignment was officially signed over to Cayuga on July 10, 1959, for $750. A corresponding footnote reads, A few reference guides have mistakenly stated the purchase price was $500, paid immediately after she came up with the idea. Cancelled checks, a checkbook ledger, and progress reports verify the accuracy of the information. So, bam! Me and Mark Zickery just got schooled. Like, hands smacked with a ruler by the headmistress style. We're gonna have to stay after school and pound erasers or something. But you know, Grams isn't exactly infallible. He spelled Madeline's name wrong. He spells it M-A-D-E-L-I-N-E, but it's actually M-A-D-E-L-O-N. So what's more important, the spelling of her name or the amount she got paid? Yeah. Neener, neener, Gramsci. Anyway, so it cost Rod 750 bucks and a fridge, not 500 bucks and zero appliances. There, the air has been cleared. Everything has been put right. You know, coming clean is kind of refreshing. I feel renewed somehow. Now, one final thought on And When the Sky Was Opened. I've suffered from moderate to severe depression for most of my life, and there have been times, many times, where I've just wanted to give up, to let go, disappear, like Forbes and Gart and Harrington. It occurred to me as I was rewatching the episode that it could be interpreted as a metaphor for suicidal ideation, not the actual mechanics of history rewriting itself and erasing a person, but the experience of the characters gradually separating from reality. The realization that one doesn't fit in, the gnawing suspicion that whatever place one occupies in the world is neither deserved nor guaranteed, the anger of being let down by the people in your life, family or friends or both, the resignation one feels when everything's just too much to bear, the numbing acceptance associated with finally giving up. I mentioned the five stages of grief earlier for a reason. And I must admit, I was a bit taken aback when all this occurred to me, and I did go down a bit of a rabbit hole digging through the episode for supporting evidence. I didn't really find anything concrete, and I don't really think Matheson or Serling intended to go that deep or that dark. I'm sure neither had depression or suicide on their minds, but for whatever reason, my brain made, or tried to make, that connection. It really gave me pause, and it really made me think, which I suppose is never a bad thing. Now, your mileage may vary, as always, but for me, this line of thinking added a whole new psychological layer to the episode that I'd never even conceived of before. I continue to find new things, real and imagined, as I revisit the series. Now, kids, if you ever feel like you don't belong, and that there's no place for you in the world, and maybe the only thing tethering you to life is a flimsy act of will on your part, and you're tempted to just let go and disappear, well, that's when you grit your teeth and hold on tighter. 
Hold on till your knuckles turn white and the joints in your fingers feel like they're on fire. You find one thing, just one thing, worth sticking around for. Maybe it's a person, or a book, or a movie, or a song, or a pet. Just one thing that makes you happy. And make that your reason for holding on. And you hang on to it while you find more things. And if you can't find anything, call 1-800-273-8255 and talk to someone. It's just a phone call. Hey, I just gave you a free podcast. The least you can do is make one phone call from me. Questions, comments, complaints? Hit us up on Facebook and or Tumblr. Just search for at ZonePod and you'll find us. You could also bypass social media altogether and email us directly at zonepod at gmail.com. I want to thank Tom Elliott again for contributing his time and talents and his wonderful voice this week. Plus, as always, thanks to the irrepressible Dr. Reba Wisner for her musical insights. Next week, well, next week, we're going to take a break from episode analysis and instead present a conversation with Mark Dewidziak, author of the book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, A Fifth Dimension Guide to Life, which is a really fun read. So if you want to do your homework and be super prepared, buy the book and read it between now and next week. Come back in seven days. Till then, kids, play nice. Between light and shadow.